let's see. In terms of presentation, I, I thought that given the audience, y you guys, uh, and the nature of what we're doing here and, and how fun it is just to be able to talk about any probably more interesting future-looking stuff than I normally get to, I spent a lot of time just trying to explain to people what Second Life is. In fact, how many, how many people in here have used Second Life, have like logged in? Okay, good. So one thing to note, Bruce was saying, is if you haven't, and, and you, you have the capability to do so right now, like download it and uh, give it a try while I'm talking. And if you have any questions about it, or are, you know, feel like you're crawling over broken glass trying to figure it out, as, as one person said the other day, which I thought was just, just a great description of the Second Life new user experience. Uh, uh, you can just shout and ask me, but if you, if you go to secondlife.com or secondlife.com slash download to get the client, you can actually just fire it up and go in here. You know, the pictures, what I thought I would do is I picked a couple things to talk about before just taking questions from you guys, which is frankly what I'd rather do is get, let people guide me here and talk, because I love to just do that. I don't, again, I don't usually get the chance to. So I'll keep it short initially and talk about a few things that I thought of that I thought might be relevant in terms of the connection between virtual worlds and what you're studying here. Um, then what we can do is take questions. In terms of the pictures in the background, these are random pictures taken from Flickr that are from a Second Life slide uh, photo pool. So they're just pictures people are taking in Second Life like, I don't know, hours ago or something. And I just started it to that and paused it and I'm going to let it play here in a minute. But you know, you're going to see more like sex and, and beauty than you normally see in Second Life, which you know, people have remarked on before when I do this. I mean, people that don't get it see me do this presentation format. They're like, wait a minute, it's all about swimsuits. Um, of course it's not, that's just essentially an answer to one of the many interesting questions which Second Life answers, which is, you know, when people dress up, any, when people can be anything they want to be and take pictures of anything they want to, and they're not restricted at all in, in terms of even being human or, you know, absolutely anything, they are in the world of biota in a very sort of generalized sense, you know, what do they choose? And I suppose in some sense, looked at optimistically or pessimistically, this is, this is what it is. But um, I also enjoyed, you know, when they made, uh, when they made Sesame Street, they would uh, try to figure out whether they were making, whether Sesame Street was successful in uh, educating and entertaining little kids. And little kids can't take questionnaires. So they did this thing in the 60s where they'd put Sesame Street and then they'd put a picture of like a piece of art next to it and then they'd change the picture like every five seconds and they'd watch the kids' eye movements. And if the kids sassaded, looked over at the picture, they knew that they were losing the kids' attention and they needed to make that part of the show more interesting. So this is like that, like, can I compete with the photographs from Second Life in terms of talking to you? Um, okay, so uh, the beginnings of Second Life uh, are, are relevant because I think of the connections between Second Life and more broadly, the sort of stuff that you're studying here and, and generally kind of where the world is going. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, um, I didn't start off as an entrepreneur who wanted to make money, who was interested in social networks. Um, I didn't really have a background in any of this stuff. I had no formal, uh, well, I, did, I didn't have a scientific background that included virtual life or, uh, or, or even really the web. I, I just had a very strong passion from the time I was a kid to kind of build the world's greatest Lego kit. Uh, which to me, since I was young, and, and I, I started programming computers when I was a kid, I studied physics in college, did a bunch of programming as a kid. To me, the ultimate use of a computer, very similar to what Bruce uh, just said to us a moment ago, was to put a whole bunch of them together and simulate a virtual world that would be sort of like a big Lego kit, except where the atoms would be digital. And you could build things out of those digital atoms. That was what I was completely driven by. Uh, and very much like Bruce, I, I, it's, it's funny the parallels there, I also was really of the mind that, uh, and, and I'm younger, well, actually, no, I think Bruce and I are about the same age. 47, 47 okay, I'm 40. Um, I was also strongly of the belief that the ideas that I had about this stuff were too early. Um, I was like way into the idea of a generalized virtual world <clears throat> and what you could do with one uh, before Snow Crash got written, uh, you know, I was just nuts about this stuff. Um, my wife, when Snow Crash came out, uh, we, were, we were already dating them this a long time ago. She brought me a copy of Snow Crash and said, oh, you're going to like this. Um, but the, <clears throat> the general idea of using a whole lot of computers to simulate a digital world and then build things inside it was something that I thought was uh, too hard to do in the mid-90s even, when, when the internet really, when I found the internet, when I really started programming for it. Um, I, I, I thought that... Uh, there was not enough computational power and there was not enough network speed, there was not enough graphics capabilities on computers to 
uh, render this kind of stuff in a way that would be compelling enough to get enough people. I was also very into this idea that you had to have critical mass, that there had to be a load of people that were doing things in the space for it to be of any interest at all uh, in terms of its kind of generative capabilities. So I basically uh, didn't work on it from 1995 until uh, 19, well, let's see, 94, 95. 1999, I went and worked at a company called Real Networks in the meantime, kind of learned how to run big software projects, and then left in 99 because NVIDIA released the GeForce 2, which is a sort of a famous piece of computer, computer, more recent piece of computing history. That was the first real GPU, and I figured that with that, with a broadband internet connection and with a reasonably fast CPU, you could do something that looked uh, interesting enough, like, yeah, like that, to, to be acceptable to people and get them intrigued by what was going on in the virtual environment. So Second Life is that. It's, it's just the idea, and we'll play with it later, it's just the idea of a big sandbox or playground in which you can create and build just about anything. Um, and that's very relevant to the future that you guys are talking about here. Because in, in a sort of a weird parallel way, what we're really doing right now is we're sort of almost exploring two paths, right? We're trying, to take, we're trying to take control of the atoms in the physical world, which will give us this unusual ability to basically reorganize ourselves and all this stuff around us in any way that we want, right? And, and we're talking about all the, the challenges and dangers and ethics and uh, perils of, of, of going down that road, as we seem to you know, unavoidably be doing, you know, which is why I'm passionate about what I do and passionate about the ideas like the singularity university in general. But there's a second path, which is rather interesting, which is, well, why don't you just do all that in the digital domain? Why don't you just say, we're not going to, it's almost an eco-friendly position. We're not going to mess around with these atoms, because God only knows what's going to happen to us when we do. Um, and instead, we'll just simulate all this digitally, and then we'll just go into that digital world somehow, and uh, build and do the same things in the digital world that we would like to do in the real world. And so in a way, Second Life is that. It's, it's trying to do that to the greatest extent that we can with the equipment that we have available today. And it's, it's in many ways, and I wanted to talk about a couple of those things, the answer to the question, uh, what's going to happen to the real world as we increasingly are able to control the atoms? So the real world, I mean, the, the real world, as it becomes more malleable, more plastic, more controllable, more reorganizable, as we ourselves become more redefinable in our bodies and our lives, um, we probably will tend to look like or to become like and behave like people do, at least to a certain extent, inside Second Life. Um, so it's sort of an interesting test bed and I think a learning ground for, for, for you guys uh, to, to be thinking about. Um, Oh, I, well, I wanted to tell you just how big the world is right now, to give you an idea. Second Life's still small. There, there's probably a million people that really actively use it, but there's a few things about it that are fairly big um, already. Uh, the total size of the grid, Bruce had that wonderful picture of, you know, taking the grid up in order of magnitude and seeing things go from uh, simple molecular structures to cells and things like that. Uh, so where are we with Second Life? Um, Second Life today is about 25,000 cores. Maybe it's 30,000 now. And it's expanding quite quickly because people like you guys are buying land in Second Life, which essentially expands the number of cores and causes my company to make more money. Um, the, the, so it's about 25,000 computing cores connected together uh, at, at big broadband speeds. Um, dark fiber networks, three facilities in the United States. 25,000 cores is quite a bit. I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's about like this room full of equipment. People out here probably know more about that than I do. but. It's, it's something like that. It's about as many racks as you'd put in this room. That's pretty big. Uh, the, the, in terms of computational capacity, you know, you can do the math on that. It's substantial. Uh, it's about 200 terabytes of data. Now, that's the stuff that people have made coming into Second Life. And you're seeing, of course, many, many snapshots of this. Second Life is uh, uh, about, five, about 600 square miles of stuff. And the density on the ground is about the same as Manhattan. And Manhattan is about 25 square miles. So it's really big in terms of the, the sheer uh, complexity of it. You will not, it just, just like the early days of the internet, you will not at this point in your lifetime ever see all of Second Life by any, any shot. So Second Life is kind of at the place that the internet was at, practically speaking, in, I don't know, like 95 or 96, maybe 95, right? When it was kind of game over in terms of exploring it all, when you realized that the categorical search engines were going to fail, you just sort of saw that, oh, geez, this thing's getting like so much larger than that, this, you know, this stuff's gonna, it, this is really big. So we, we've got an interesting uh, scale now, but Second Life is still used by 
only a tiny fraction of the world's population. And the reason for that is not that it isn't interesting to build with Legos. It's really interesting to build with Lego blocks, to build yourself, to build the world around you. It's that it's unbelievably difficult to figure out Second Life. Unbelievably strong word. But Second Life ain't Twitter. Um, it, it, isn't, it, it, it'll, it takes you more than five minutes. It isn't fun. It isn't Halo. It, it isn't a fun video game. It's, ex it's excruciatingly difficult to figure out what's going on in there. But like the early days of the internet, the rewards to, for those who do are very large. One interesting observation I would make about this 25,000 cores and 200 terabytes, I, I like to, th and I throw this out for you guys because I think it's something for you to ponder. I always think that human evolution, one of the things that tends to happen, not human evolution, uh, business evolution, one of the things that tends to happen uh, with computers and technology lately is that we kind of use computers for the coolest, the, I was always struck by this question of what's the coolest thing you can do with a lot of servers? You know, do you store books on them? Do you have a shopping center on them, like Amazon? Do you, do you store all the world's information on them, like Google? You know, do you store search indexes on them? There's a sort of interesting question of, like, what's the coolest thing you can do with a computer? And of course, as, as you guys are talking about here, one of the interesting things to think about in the future is we're going to try to make computers think, right? We're going to try to make computers simulate thinking, consciousness, thought. And so, you know, there's an, interesting, there's an interesting observation here about this, which is our company is profitable today. We make about, I'm just going to, in round numbers, our company makes about $100 million a year. We're about 300 people. So in a sense, if you think about it, one way of looking at it is that 25,000 core mess of equipment does something that entertains about a million, million people and makes about $100 million a year. And here's, here you'll see where I'm going to. Depending on how you do the math, and this is the stuff you guys are taking classes in here, that's probably about equal to one brain. I mean, what's kind of interesting is that Second Life at 200 terabytes and 25,000 cores, it's probably about like one of us, right? You can go into all this rich debate about exactly how we're going to simulate thinking and what parts of it we are and aren't going to simulate, but, I, but no matter how you kind of do the math, it's, it's in the ballpark. The, 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 the total assemblage of equipment that Second Life has. So what's sort of interesting to ask is, if you had some sort of a thinking machine today that was 25,000 cores and 200T of data, and it was running and using all the bandwidth we're using and everything, would it generate $100 million a year in revenue? I just thought that's a fascinating entrepreneur's question, right? Because if it will, then, then, that it's, then it's one of those cases where people will move energy and interest toward it quite rapidly. If it won't, on the other hand, you have this interesting conundrum, because there are sometimes great ideas which don't get built for a long time because nobody can finance them or come up with a way to make money on them. So I was just driving up in the car, driving down from San Francisco in my car, and thinking, like, how, if you were like the first you know, virtual pet or something, you know, could you make 100 million bucks a year? Maybe you could, especially if you're the first one. Um, so that's a thought about that. But, but, but Second Life, the other thing that's important about Second Life, if you don't know this, and I think this has been true of the internet and many other uh, technology phenomena that have come to change the world is they always have to make money for people on a sort of a personal basis to really, for, for the engine to really get started and change to really happen at a radical speed, that you have to have, um, you have to uh, have some way to make money. Second Life has a microcurrency built into it that we built called the Linden Dollar that lets you buy and sell things from each other. Um, this microcurrency, using this microcurrency, people exchange a total of about a million and a half dollars in transactions of about a dollar US in size per day. Uh, so that's a lot of transactions. It's like 10 per second or whatever. Uh, it also means that the GDP of Second Life is about the size of a kind of a medium-sized American city, which is, which is about a half billion dollars a year. San Francisco, by comparison, is about six billion dollars GDP. Um, so order magnitude smaller, average size. San Francisco is one of the big cities. Second Life has about that scale right now in terms of GDP. That's important because what it does is it creates a living for currently about maybe, we don't know exactly because it's sort of like the IRS. I mean, you, you, you can't really tell what people are doing inside Second Life, but there's probably three or 4,000 people that are uh, making some, some form of a living in Second Life. If you don't know, many of them doing things like selling the clothing, jewelry, cars, houses, and stuff that you're seeing in those pictures. M many people make those things and sell them. And I'll get to that. One really important thing about how the world's going to be different is there's no cost of goods and there's very little distribution cost associated with that work. It's almost entirely creative work. So one of the ways the world's going to change as we take control of the atoms or as we use virtual worlds is that you have the ability to essentially convert creative energy directly into money in a way that the real world just has not given us. We just have not. There really are very few examples uh, that you can think of in the real world of that. I mean, I guess you could look at like making music or something, but that, that's incredibly esoteric compared to how broadly 
people are doing the same thing here. So one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was why go in there at all? Again, what are some of the more pragmatic reasons today why people are going to actually use virtual worlds as opposed to just taking pictures of them? Um, I thought I'd pick out a couple of examples, again, that you might find interesting to think about and talk about here. Um, one really mundane one, really, really simple. You can take a bunch of avatars in Second Life and you can sit in a circle and you can have a meeting. So you just log on, you come to the meeting, you can have this meeting here. We do, there, there are conferences like this all the time that go on entirely inside Second Life. You've probably heard about this before. But I just wanted to talk about one tiny feature of that and how it relates to the brain. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, everyone here has been on a conference, probably on a conference call, where you were t using a speakerphone. And everyone here has a uniformly negative reaction toward that, right? And there's nothing more loathsome than a speakerphone. Why is that? And there's nothing worse than a conference call where there's multiple people on the other end of the speakerphone. So why is that? The reason for that is that your brain uses the idea of where a person is in space as a way of understanding their speech. And so when you hear me talking up here right now, and you can also see me and my lips moving at the same time, and you, the sound of my voice, actually I'm amplified, but the sound of my voice uh, is appears to be coming from what your brain imagines to be a single point in space, that gives you the best ability to understand what I'm saying. On a speakerphone, all the people in the other room are talking through the speakerphone. And so you find yourself doing a couple of annoying things. One is you look at that stupid speakerphone, right? <laughs> and then you ask yourself after some period of time has gone by, why am I doing that? It's a telephone. There's nothing more to learn about it. The reason that you're doing that is because you're doing an orienting thing. Your brain is basically looking toward the speaker. It does that automatically. You're imagining that there are little people in that phone talking to you. And unfortunately, when the second person talks at the same time as the first person on the other end of the line, they talk from the same point in space, which means you can't understand both of them at the same time. Horrible experience. Simple practical reason for virtual worlds, um, 3D spatialized voice is doable in a virtual world. You could also do it on a web page, like with little dots and stuff. But I, I think practically, probably people will do it in virtual worlds because there's other reasons why virtual worlds are compelling. But that simple fact that when you, when you go to a meeting in Second Life, you just say, especially if your company has an office there, you just say to your friends, yeah, the meeting's on Monday you know, in the red room, the, the red room, the one on the, and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, OK, that room, I'll find it. Think about that. Compare, and then you go into that room. So, so no conference code to dial in, no, no, you know, no stuff you have to do before the meeting. All you have to do is show up, walk into the room, chat with your friends beforehand, which you can do, and then walk in the hall, walk into the meeting, and have the meeting. Uh, and when you're in that meeting, you can understand two, three, four people talking at the same time. Small technology change, but extremely high impact in terms of driving people's behavior. So my personal belief is that um, meetings for work in particular are a very specific example of where technology essentially broadly is going to take advantage of some needs that we have as people. And it's going to radically change things. It's going to be an exponential change. It's starting now. Nobody gets it. I, I guess as a, company, as, a, as a company leader, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I would hope that they continue to not get it so we can collect all the money. But I, I don't, I, as a humanist, I think that it's better to sort of see this stuff all happen and happen as quickly as possible. But basically, the idea of going to New York and sitting together in an office building as a way of doing work, there's no way that idea has got more than a few years to, to live. Because it's too simple. All, all you need is a laptop. You get, this, you get this 3D voice. You don't have to travel. You can integrate people from all over the world in your company meetings. Yes, you can show PowerPoint slides if you want to while you're at the meeting. That works fine in Second Life. Um, you can talk to people. Uh, it, it's going to be a tremendous change, tremendous force for change. It's just the simple fact that people are going to meet and collaborate and work in these virtual spaces. So that's one thing to think about. Um, a second thing about it is this concept called the memory palace. Does anybody know the memory palace idea? Like, does anybody heard it? Only a couple people. Oh, how, how cool. Of course, Bruce has. Um, the memory palace is the fact that if you, if you ask people to memorize really large strings of information, like people that have an unusually acute memory, and you ask them how they do it, they tell you this story. Memory Palace goes back to a story of a, a monk that traveled to China and was almost killed by the Chinese. The Chinese were going to kill this missionary unless he showed him something cool. And the missionary showed him the Memory Palace. I don't know how he, how, how he was fortunate enough to come up with this idea. And that amused the Chinese, and they didn't kill him. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that he described was that you, you memorize things by uh, 
taking the numbers or the facts or whatever that you need to remember and imagining them being written on the walls in the rooms of a huge mansion. If you think about it, as soon as I say in a huge, you can imagine a huge mansion, right? Like you can hold it in your head. And then all you have to do is imagine that in the room on the wall there's this number. And it turns out that actually works quite well. And if you do it a little bit in your head, you'll find out that it works. There's a simple example of why the memory palace idea is effective, which is, can you remember the book you read while you were last on vacation? Yes. And can you remember the second or third to the last book you read on your nightstand at home? No, in all likelihood. And the reason for that is that the vacation environment is a 3D immersive environment. When you were on vacation, you were somewhere. Um, that is an, a very novel environment. It's an example of this memory palace effect. When you're in an unusual environment, like for those of you who have not been in this room before, I don't know if you guys have been doing classes here for days or not, but um, if you're in a novel environment and you hear somebody speak, have a meeting or whatever, you actually remember the contents of that meeting better. And there's numerous uh, tests of this over the years, including our surviving missionary. So uh, the, the memory palace, that, so the, the point there, obviously, you can imagine is that Second Life is full of thousands and thousands of distinct environments because they're so easy to make. So you can have your business offsite or whatever on the beach in Fiji. Um, and you will retain the information that you get during that meeting better. And this isn't a choice that you get to make about your brain. And it's not something you can train yourself to do in another way. I mean, training yourself to have higher retention at meetings is really hard and it's not going to happen. But people are going to start using virtual worlds for the very fact that the same information delivered in a novel environment is more memorable. Um, there's another thing about 3D environments that relates more directly in their comparison to the web, which is that we, that human beings are now, with virtual worlds being brought together into the same place, the word everybody uses for this usually is presence. Uh, Twitter is kind of almost there because you feel like you're almost being talked directly to by the person because you're, you're getting stuff only a few seconds later. It's actually a little bit out of the distance of neurological presence, which is more on the level of fractions of a second. When, when, we, when, we, when we have a sort of a response chat, when, when we feel other people in our presence around us, uh, we're, we're generally delighted by that and interested in taking advantage of it. So for example, the example I always give when I talk about this is, when you, when you go on Amazon.com and you're shopping for a digital camera and you're on that page where you're looking at the digital camera, there's like 100 other people browsing that page right at the same time as you. Statistically, it's got to be true. They're, they're watching the same page. Wouldn't it be nice if you could see them and talk to them? You wouldn't have to, but if you wanted to, think how many times there'd be a question about the product, a question about Amazon itself fun to be had just in talking to the people who were browsing the same content you were. The web's technology doesn't intrinsically give us the ability to be present with other people. In fact, the web and media over the last 50 years or so has increasingly made us separate because the technology of it has been limited to a kind of a singular one to one, many to one or one person listening kind of distribution of the content. Virtual worlds and the, and the technologies of low latency internetworking uh, will now, I predict, tend to kind of bring us together again. And there's a tremendous desire that people have to be in each other's presence. The, the, the nerdiest person with an engineering background like myself who gets into Second Life and stays in there, we've done these surveys. It's hilarious. You'll get somebody who is the most, the last person you'd expect to want a lot of human contact. And you ask them, like, gosh, Second Life's so hard. You know, you got in there. You built a business for yourself. You know, you, you learned how to do scripting, and you built cool guns in Second Life that you now sell to other people. Why would you stay in? Invariably, I mean, literally, almost to a person, the person will say, well, I met this really cool guy, and he scripted this cool stuff. And I thought I'd show off and show him what I could do and come back. There's, there's, there's a tremendous appeal to, to human presence, to, to making contact with other people when you're, when you're doing work, when you're shopping, when you're whatever. So, I think that the, the, the internet, a lot of the content consumption that we do on the internet today would work better if we, had, if we were surrounded by and immersed in a space full of other people. And so I think that's another reason for uh, a general move toward, toward 3D. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about and then take questions is kind of, I'll, I'll just tell you some of the stuff that I think is going to be different. I touched on some of these already. Um, it, it, I'm sorry, different in virtual worlds and as I said at the beginning. I suspect different in the real world as we increasingly make it virtual. What have we learned from Second Life? Um, one is that people are enormously more creative and interested in being creative for fun 
than we've traditionally thought of. There's this maxim, you know, when you're talking about consumer applications on the internet or you're talking about 3D content or anything like that, where people say, well, 1% of the people build all the content for the 99, or 0.1% in the media business people perform music for the rest of the people. The question is, is that a natural social balance? Is it really one person in 1,000 who is Britney Spears and the 999 are watching Britney Spears? Is that really actually the natural human norm? Is that really like where we net out? And the answer is no. It's just an artifact of the way the technology works. The recording business is, is a business, for example, that has high content production costs and high content distribution costs. It mandates that only a few people have to be listened to by thousands. When you remove that barrier, so for example, when you disintermediate or remove the costs of manufacturing and distribution, which is really pretty run of the mill in Second Life. In other words, in Second Life, you can make your own clothes or you can buy your own clothes. It's really up to you. What you find is that people are enormously more creative, iconic, and individual than what you thought. People don't all wear Gap clothes because they want to look like each other. They all wear Gap clothes because Gap clothes are cheap. It, it's a difference. It's, a, it's an, a very interesting finding. There's statistical surveys we did of this in Second Life, and they're really quite interesting. Like we watched the percentage of time, percentage of time that people spend like building stuff as opposed to just going out and buying it or consuming it. And it's like 30% of their time. And the number hasn't gone down. As we went from 100,000 people using it to 10 million people using it, number didn't change. We always thought it would. We thought that number would be a critical indicator of when we were reaching like, you know, critical mass or, or when we were like crossing the chasm or getting to mainstream or whatever. Now maybe as we really get to mainstream, since I think Second Life's not there yet, we will see that number diminish, but I don't think so. I, I think that what you see is that when you reduce people's cost of creating content, cost of being creative, they typically are. They'll actually fill the space, even people that are sort of avowedly non-creative. So that's interesting. Um, uh, gender equality, uh, globalization, uh, racial equality. One of the things Second Life shows is that we still discriminate uh, on the basis of a lot of stuff, pretty much anything we can find to make us different from other people we use as either a threat or a discriminatory separator or a way of dividing ourselves up into groups, whatever. Um, human beings are nasty about this. Uh, one of the neat things about, and, and we're probably, although we're certainly getting better, we're, we're probably not ever going to be perfect. I mean, I, I think that human beings with the threat of death and the requirement that you live in a ge geographical region, we just have some problems with uh, sort of self, non-self recognition. I mean, that's, that's a little esoteric. but. So I think that uh, we are, what happens in the virtual world is that you really are, you really don't know the person that's behind the avatar. But more importantly, like when you're in a meeting in Second Life, um, I, I, always, I always give the example of if, if you're in a real world meeting and you're a woman in the real world, and you, you guys can comment on this, I mean, listen, if there's some guy in the meeting and he's like 240 pounds and he raises his voice in the meeting, let me tell you what happens neurologically to everybody that's a lot smaller than that guy. They get scared. Now, is that guy really going to stand up and kill you in that meeting? Of course not, but it still significantly affects your behavior, and you can see all kinds of studies about this, right? What does one inch of height buy you in the real world in, uh, in uh, uh, income? Does anybody know the number? It's a statistically significant number. It's like several thousand dollars a year. Like that fact? You may not, but it's a statistical fact. In the virtual world, though, obviously, you, you, you've simply removed a lot of that stuff. You've removed people's ability to threaten each other. So you've, you've removed people's intrinsic knowledge of their whereabouts. So when you're working with somebody in Second Life, it's not that you've learned to like working with people from other countries. It's that you don't even know in many cases. Your, your whole basis for discrimination is just removed in the virtual environment. So I think that it's very, and, and, and I guess what I would say is that the, the impact of that globalization and the impact of that equality is quite significant in terms of people's like business liquidity, how, how easily and how willing they are to do business with each other and kind of engage with other people in a collaborative way. And so I think the effect on, say, the world's GDP growth of that kind of rapid globalization, and again, I think Second Life just as a precursor to what's going to happen in the real world, is, is significantly larger than you might think. So it's an interesting factor to take into account, maybe a sort of a positive counterweight to some of the things that we worry will happen as our culture uh, and as the world increasingly uh, connects and uses this technology. Um, 
Oh, the, the, the last thing I wanted to say, and then take some questions, is microtransactions. I mentioned before all these microtransactions. Can't you feel it today that the web lacks a, a real microtransaction infrastructure? Look at, I, look at I, the I, iPhone, the iStore. All, all that they did was essentially put a trusted credit card infrequent billing front end on a microtransaction system, and now everybody's out buying music. You know, you'd probably be buying stuff other than music if you could buy it that easily, right? It's just that the only thing you can buy with microtransactions today is music. Oh, and apps for your iPhone. And look, people buy them like hotcakes. Uh, a couple of things in Second Life. So in Second Life, there's a microtransaction system that's built in. I can, I can give somebody a penny. I could give all you guys some pennies in this room just as easily as pointing at you and clicking. You can't do that in the real world. Um, what, hap what tends to happen then? People tend to spend more and engage in things more. People buy smaller items more readily in Second Life. Charity, really interesting example. Per capita, people give a lot more to charitable causes and benefits and, and uh, events and stuff inside Second Life. And I don't think it's just because Second Life is such an early adopter community of people that are, that are broad-minded. I think that's true, but I think there's an additional factor there in place, which is it's just so easy. Uh, live music performers in Second Life who are very successful. Some of you know people have gotten record recording label gigs from playing the blues in Second Life, playing music there. Uh, you just put a tip jar on the table, but in Second Life, to give the person a tip, you can do it from across the room. You can give them 25 cents. They won't see you walk up and put only a quarter in the tip jar. There's all these different dynamics like that that cause uh, it to be very easy to give to causes and to give a small amount of money to people for things. So I think microtransactions is another example of where uh, the real world is going to be profoundly changed as those mechanisms become extant in in, in, this, in, the, in the real space. So I think that's another like big, I was just trying to think of like big technology trends to talk about today that are, that are uh, predicted by the virtual world. So let me, let, me, let me stop there and give a lot more time to like take questions or be guided by you guys or whatever you want to talk about. Um, uh, you talk about PowerPoints for meetings. Um, can you directly upload now a PowerPoint or you said this um, mechanism where it's translated to get files for us? So uh, the question is, can you, how do you watch PowerPoint in Second Life? We're actually, I think, going to play a little bit in Second Life, not, not with my slides, but uh, somebody here is going to take us. Oh, there he is. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to go tour around a little bit in Second Life. Um, you can do PowerPoints in Second Life a couple of ways today. You can, uh, do, you can do a couple things. But you see it in the roundabout way, or can you directly? No, you can, you can directly. Uh, oh, right now you cannot upload a PPT file and have it directly played back by the system. But you can uh, uh, out output to JPEG and up up upload the images to an object that shows the images. However, what you can also do in Second Life today is you can play back a web page as the media target for a, a property. So in a part of the world like this room, I can take that surface and make it a URL. And then I can change that pay web page URL. That feature works today. The, the direct handling of PowerPoints uh, and other media types is a big project that we're working on now in Second Life to try to support more and more the formats. The question is, uh, some of these images are beautifully, beautifully rendered, almost like Oblivion or, I don't know, GTA 4, or et cetera, right. et cetera. But when you look at this guy cruising Second Life, it right. looks much simpler. Yep. So there's a number of, so the question is, why are, the, why are some of the renderings so much better? Um, I didn't look at all these pictures. Some people do Photoshop their images. The, 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 these are an image that can have gone through filtering and processing. Um, however, in some of the images, ah, like that one, see her shadow? You can see the shadow of the chair cast back on the floor. There's a feature that you can turn on if you have a really good graphics card in Second Life that many people who take pictures use, which turns on, it's called Shadow Draft, which turns on, I don't know, just as a, as a 3D graphics person or a little bit of one, it, it's just the coolest stuff. It's like total. Uh, multiple objects, multiple shadows, soft shadows, projectors, uh, multiple light sources with multiple shadows. It, it's super, super cool. But you have to have like a, I don't know, maybe somebody here has used it. You have to have a ridiculous, you have to have a, a very new graphics card that, that can run uh, the particular shader language that, that we're using to do that. And it works pretty well. Let me go right there. Thank you. I do. I don't currently use Second Life, but I'm really interested in uh, the opportunities for working with virtual teams. For example, in this example of presentations and things like that. Have you considered integrating Facebook Connect or ways that you could get like 20 people on your team to get on Second Life really quickly for 
first question. And second question, opportunities for working with not-for-profits or getting, you know, really mobilizing people to give to charity through Second Life who may or may not already be on Second Life. So I'll take the second one first. So the second question is, uh, you know, how, how, how do you get not-for-profits and other charitable organizations more kind of able to impact people in Second Life? I think the biggest challenge, unfortunately, is that today it still is about a several hour learning curve to really kind of get comfortable in there. So the problem is attracting, th there are a number of places in Second Life where a not-for-profit can go, it's easy to search for, uh, and get like somebody who will totally personally help you set up events and do everything that your organization would want to do inside Second Life. I think that piece of it is actually like fairly well served today. The problem is that the audience isn't big enough. There's about 300,000 people a day using Second Life, about maybe a million plus that really are actively using it, all told. Uh, so even though they spend a tremendous amount of time in the world, they only have so much money to give. You know, you can almost look at you know, the total amount of participation, energy, and money that they can present. So, so that's, I think, coming simply as, we view our biggest challenge as a technology company is just reducing the learning curve to the point where it's easier to get into. And that's probably a partial answer to the first question, which is in a way there's this disconnect between things like Facebook that are extremely easy to, to casually interact with, and then Second Life, which requires more commitment and time. Um, I haven't actually used Facebook Connect yet, but I want to. I haven't looked at how it works for business groups. I do use Facebook, just the normal thing. Um, we are right now, a bunch of us, thinking internally about exactly how to connect with Facebook. And I, yeah, I would say that like connecting virtual worlds to social networking sites is very straightforward. Some, because sometimes people think of us as like competitive. There's no competition. Social networking sites essentially establish uh, human identity, real, real identity, and then social graphs between people. We need to, yeah, totally import those social graphs into Second Life. You should totally be able to go on a Facebook group and say, everybody show up in Second Life right now. Because as I said, it's the spatialization of the 3D, of the, of the world, the, the, the digital atoms that make it meaningful, and then the fact that you're, all your friends can be present at the same time. Whereas on Facebook, you're not intrinsically, conceptually present. You're not all there. Boss. Well, there's some projects. Uh, yeah, what, you know, there there are some interesting projects. There's there's this there's this project called OpenSim, which is an alternative Second Life simulator that the Second Life normal clients can actually hook up to, that allows you to create a a, a server environment which has like very different physical rules, um, but you can plug in a different physics engine, for example. Is there a reason that you haven't already? Or are there um, we uh, we could turn off physics. Nobody really wants us to that much. I mean, I, I mean, we, we can actually do that. I think there's been a lack of, uh, well, th there's a longer conversation there about like what, what are you going to do there. Simulating space is awesome. And I mean, that's the, you know, the sort of stuff like that the people here at NASA, NASA would like to do and in fact to a great degree already have done or have done some of inside Second Life, which we can see. Uh, the, the problem, I think, is that full spatialized sort of simulation where you're, you're really sort of three-dimensionally free. You don't have this sort of two-dimensional column space. Second Life is a flat 2D grid today. Every simulator manages all the airspace above it. That is a, uh, going to full 3D is actually a harder, a harder problem because it makes everything to the cube rather than to the square in terms of computational requirements. Uh, but but we're, we're opening up a bunch of aspects of our system as fast as we can to allow projects like OpenSim and others like we're, working, we, we're continuing to work on versions of our simulators that can be modded and used in that same way. Uh, it just hasn't been as mainstream. We've been one of those little companies, even at 300 people, we're still little, that's been just, there's just such an onslaught of things that people want us to do. Group instant messaging, a very hard problem and something that's like totally screwed up in Second Life right now, is just one example of a very difficult design problem that everybody's screaming at us to fix because Nobody's really had it before, and when you actually use it in Second Life, it's very compelling. Actual live, basically live group chat amongst the people in your group. It's, it's a tough thing to do. Like, for example, in Facebook, you can't do that. You can't do live group chat. Um, let's see, who's next? Uh, let's go back there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so when you have prompted us to go on Second Life while you're talking and make an avatar, I, I tried it out. <laughs> when, you, when you prompted us to try on Second Life uh, a little earlier in the lecture, I, I tried it out. 
uh, and my my clothes are a mess. I keep walking into walls. These are yep. not things that, that usually trouble me in the real world in those days. So, so my question is, what's really the appeal of second life to people who are, who are reasonably well adjusted already in the real world? And you know, I kind of make a joke out of it, but have you guys noticed a schism developing where people who are already you know fairly hooked into the online community as kind of our main social network find second life a pretty appealing option, and people who are not Right. Entirely into that sort of thing, get even more distance from the, from that. Well, I don't think you. Uh, so yeah. So the so the, the the question there is yeah. It's and those are two of the great experiences that one sadly tends to have when you first log in, right? You you, it's very hard to to do anything with your avatar. It's it's totally hard to get an avatar that looks like one of these. I look like a refugee. Yeah. It's it's just yeah. You look like a refugee. It's 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 really hard. But the uh, the the thing is. Uh, Again, it's kind of like the early days of the internet. What if, what if you could make $25,000 a month doing work there? Yeah. Right. But, and, and then the other thing is, what if the work you're doing, what if you're helping somebody that lives in, in rural England? I, I mean, the, the, the thing is, I, I think one of, the one of the things that's interesting about Second Life is that we looked at the usage of it in New York and Los Angeles per capita, and it's lowest in those cities in the United States, where of course you'd expect it to be higher because, and, and San Francisco, because of the technical you know, sophistication of people. And the answer is exactly that, which is if you're really happy with your first life, if it's really kicking butt, if you're basically already an avatar, you're living in New York City, you go out and you know the Lower East Side, I don't know what to tell you. You're probably not going to jump into the virtual world, but ultimately the virtual world is going to get you. It's just a matter of time. Because you know, as I often say when I'm asked about this stuff, right? The, the quality of the experience there, the detail of the avatar, all this stuff, remember, we're not stopping at as good as this. I mean, the, the, the detail, frankly, what you can do with an avatar in Second Life already in many ways kind of exceeds what you'll ever be able to do with your own like appearance in the real world. You know, the, the coolness of clothing in Second Life exceeds that which we will ever see now in the real world. But I'm talking about like what a forest looks like. I mean, talk about a more profound, you know, oh my God, you know, you could never, you know, compete with nature, oh, sure we can. As the, as the, as the rendering and simulation density of the, these things go up by Moore's law, we're going to catch and surpass reality. I, I always give the example, nobody, nobody shoots back shots in New Zealand anymore for movies. Did you notice that? The last movie where they drug cameras out to New Zealand and sat and looked at waterfalls with cameras had to be like one of the Lord of the Rings movies. I mean, I'm not saying it was a long time ago, but check it out. Check out the state of the art today. Actually, there's probably people here who know about this better than I do. You render those back shots now. Now, it's not real time. It takes hours and hours to do a real proper, you know, elven forest, right? But Second Life will reach that in real time. The, the gap between Pixar and, and uh, real time rendering is, is now like four or five years. So, I don't know, it's, it's, I, I could argue about that all day, but it, it's, 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 the right, it's the right question. I mean, I, I think that some people will be able to do things today, like somebody who's handicapped. Now you're talking, right? You're, you'll be willing to figure out how to get your avatar looking good if you're, if you're in a wheelchair in the real world. Because, because walking in the virtual world is something that you can't do in the real world. And flying, so flying would be my simple one. It, you can't fly. I mean, you can't, right? If you hit page up, there you'll. I know, I know. But if you hold down page up on that laptop, it'll do it. Uh, can you say something about the overview statistic about how much energy um, Second Life is used as well against the Brazilian? And, and, uh, oh yeah, that was total. That's that was okay. total crap. I, I mean, I can go into that. Yeah. The um, there was a sort of phase of all the PR companies using Second Life on products and the demo and things. It, and we just think that's still continuing. And sort of more interestingly, what sort of do you have any data of people using or wiring themselves up in the real world to move their avatars whilst they're not actually in Second Life and sort of carrying on living? And copying what they're doing in the real world. Do you have any data on that? Or do you think this is your company? Yeah. Get around sort of the real world wide up faster? No, not yet. So, the, uh, the, to the second question, this idea of augmented reality, that we somehow can use Second Life in an obvious way to just mirror, mirror world what we're doing with the real world, I have no idea how that's going to work. I don't even know. I can't even imagine how it's going to work in a decade. I really don't know. I'm not saying that it won't in some strange way. I'm just giving a direct answer, which is we. We don't, at present, I don't see any really compelling applications yet for that. 
But of course, if you look at some of the fiction that's been look, written about that near future, and you imagine, you can see some things working. Like if the real world got like meta tagged in some way that was super, super cool, then you could walk around and you could see all those tags on things, on people, on objects, whatever. I, I just have a chicken or the egg entrepreneur's question about how we get to that density of information. Stepping back to the first question, which was how much power does Second Life take? The material question is the comparable, the comparison between doing something in Second Life and doing it in the real world, and the difference in energy consumption, including the Second Life servers, is 100 to 1 to thousands to 1 to the advantage of the virtual world. So virtual worlds are very likely to be an eco-solution for a number of things. I, I mean, you could imagine the difference. Obviously, the dumb, the dumb one to pick on would be the difference, the delta between flying to New York or doing the meeting in Second Life. It's 11,000 pounds of CO2 or something on that single flight, single person to New York. It's unbelievable. But even the mundane example of, I did this example one time where I was computing. If you had a, if you had a bar next door to your house, and you walked out the front door, went in the bar, sat and had a drink with some friends, and then walked home, it would still be immensely more energy wasteful to do that than to log into Second Life and go sit with your friends in the bar in Second Life. Can you follow why that would be? Because you have a secondary physical location, however small, even a relatively small bar, has to cool and light itself. And it turns out that that's quite a bit of power, a lot more power than the, your PC and the servers at the Second Life grid that are supporting your activities. So it just, Second Life just has an extremely small uh, energy footprint. And that's, one, that's another thing that will drive uh, virtual world use. Um, you got the mic, actually. I can let you guys pass the mic around, and then I won't feel so bad about who to pick. I don't think this is uh, I can talk well, though. Uh, so a couple of years ago, there was this big influx of brick and mortar businesses creating these huge Second Life presences. Yeah. And, and it sort of failed spectacularly, a lot of them, like uh, Coca-Cola comes yeah. to mind. So I was just wondering, what are brick and mortar businesses doing now in Second Life that's innovative? What are right. the most successful ones coming up with? Well, first of all, Second Life still, by and large, is a kind of a smaller, I mean, it, it's still a smaller creative community like the internet was in the mid-90s. So we are, we are still sort of in 1995, 96, if you remember Amazon versus Borders. Uh, Borders came and started doing brick and mortar sales of books in the virtu in the, uh, on, the, on the web in 90, I don't know, help me somebody. It's like 95, I think, 96. Borders at the time just declared it a huge failure. They said, this is ridiculous, this internet thing. Nobody's going to buy books on it. Uh, we also was said in 96, you know, this is fine. I can do a lot of cool stuff here. But no one would ever be dumb enough to give their credit card. Like if you had to pay for something, you'd have to give your credit card. And no one would put in, no one would enter in their credit card because, of course, it'd be stolen. Um, all of, those, all of those issues got resolved as time went by. And as the mass of people that were interested in these things grew, um, so the earliest companies that came into Second Life were interested, I think, in direct-to-consumer marketing of goods and services, so things like Coca-Cola and Adidas and things like that. Um, and those uh, experiments, to a large extent, failed. Um, but they did on the internet, too. We, we used to have this game at work of looking for equivalent articles in 1996 that said all the same things, where you could just, re you could just replace the word like web with Second Life. And it was funny, you know, you'd see this like, this is a sham, I, this whole internet thing, Tim Berners-Lee, he's scamming everybody, it's not going to work. You know, it was just like, you know, all these people are going to go away in a few months. And it, it was, it, it's really, it's, it's been kind of a painful ride in that sense, because we're sort of on another thing that has, I think, very similar adoption characteristics. But um, there have been some good things that have happened. Uh, uh, recruiting, for example. Uh, I think like two days from now, Amazon, check it out. Uh, if you look it up, Amazon's having a big recruiting fair in Second Life. And Amazon's hired people directly from Second Life. The, the, the ability to sit down and talk to somebody that you're thinking about hiring in a virtual world, I won't uh, belay. Uh, there, there's a ton of reasons why it's a really cool idea. You can interview somebody very effectively in a, in a virtual world. Um, other, other examples that you might not have thought of. Um, there was, a, uh, there was an, an interesting, more practical example in another field. I mean, not, not, not mass market. I can't think of a single big mass market consumer thing. Well, actually, there's the Harry Potter example that was kind of cool. Um, one of the Harry Potter films, if you, if you look this up, they, they say, and, and you know, marketing is a tough thing to gauge sometimes, there was a Harry Potter film where right before opening, the, the marketers of the film, I'm not, this isn't the studio, but they put a ton of people into Second Life, and they gave them these really cool avatars that were totally kitted out as Harry Potter characters. And they did it virally. They let them walk around in world and like tell other people about the characters. And they were the only ones who knew about the characters. 
that was a good idea. That actually turned out, they, they, they said in, in retrospect that they believed that the opening day attendance for that film was significantly modified by the, the campaign that they did in Second Life. Um, so th there are examples where you can hit hard, but you're hitting a 65% international audience, which is fantastic, right, from a global change perspective. But if you're selling stuff in California, it's really not. So now, you know, only 40% of your audience is in the United States, only 10% of the users or whatever in California. It, you, you, get, you, you, no, you knock down to a very small set of people very quickly. Um, Oh, there's another example. I'll give you a great example. Border Patrol, Canadian Loyalist University. This is a cool idea. They, uh, it's a university really into using Second Life. They set up a, they, they, one of the things the university does is they train Border Patrol agents in finding contraband at the border when cars drive through. And you can't train somebody on site, right, in doing this. So what they did was they built a simulated Border Patrol crossing in Second Life where the students played the roles of both the people trying to smuggle stuff in. And they could show their passports, and they could talk with voice and do everything. It was very realistic. Cars drive through, car stops, open the trunk, all that stuff. They had scripted cars. And they did a study of what, how much it increased like the retention rate and stuff of the information. And it was a very significant change. <laughs>